Okay. Would you uh, stand to be sworn, gentlemen? <clears throat> you swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God. I do. Our uh, panel is made up first of Henry Ruth. Mr. Ruth was Deputy Watergate Special Prosecutor. He's currently uh, counsel to Unisys. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And second, Mr. George Frampton. Mr. Frampton is a former assistant Watergate special prosecutor and is currently president of the Wilderness Society. Gentlemen, uh, welcome. Please proceed with your statements. And this, your entire statements will be placed in the record as if read. Uh, and we would appreciate uh, uh, summarization as best as you can. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I have no prepared statement. I thought I'd take a few minutes to uh, describe what happened in Saturday Night Massacre. I was a senior man on the Watergate Special Prosecution Force that evening. The background to that was that the Watergate Special Prosecution Force had been created by a charter between the Attorney General and the Special Prosecutor. The charter had the force and effect of law. It was published in the Code of Federal Regulations. Certain irony was posted in that section of the regulations following the office of the pardon attorney. It has the force of effect of law, and in U.S. v. Nixon, the Supreme Court so held. We started our work, and it soon became clear when the existence of presidential tapes became known that the tapes were the key to tell whether or not John Dean was a liar or President Nixon was lying. On October 19, 1973, John Dean, the president's counsel, pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice. The obstruction of justice included conversations with the president of the United States. Those conversations were on the nine tapes that were the subject of the subpoena that had been upheld by the U.S. District Court and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. The White House had until Friday, October 19, to tell the court whether it was going to appeal. Friday came and went. Meanwhile, we had been in disputes with Mr. Richardson and the White House for three months on our jurisdiction. Every time we touched upon national security, we would get a call that we were exceeding our jurisdiction. And that was, in my opinion, because we did not yet know about COINTELPRO and the FBI. We did not know the full activity of the plumbers, a group of White House employees going beyond the bounds of law to invade the psychiatrist of Daniel Ellsberg. We did not know the full extent of the activities of the 10 White House employees who subsequently became felons as a result of our work. Friday, October 19, we were told by the White House that we should subpoena no more tapes and that we were to accept transcripts from John Stennis, who unfortunately had been shot the previous January and was a 72-year-old ailing man. Archie Cox, of course, refused, and we were confronted with the fact that the tapes, which were the only source of evidence, to prove whether John Dean was telling the truth was not to be ours, and so Archie Cox could not accept that. He told the nation that Saturday morning, October 20, and we waited. We wondered who was gonna fire Archie Cox because the regulation had the force and effect of law. We knew that the tapes contained evidence of a criminal conspiracy between John Dean and the President of the United States, and we didn't think anyone in the Justice Department would undertake to fire a prosecutor for securing evidence of a crime. So we speculated as to who might do it, and we did not think Elliot Richardson would do it, but we had no idea who would. About 8 o'clock that evening, Mr. Cox called me and said the White House had sent a messenger. He called me 15 minutes later to say the messenger was lost. And he called me 15 minutes later to say he'd been fired and we went into our office. From no one could we find out our status. I tried to read Mr. Richardson, he was unavailable. Mr. Ruckelshaus was unavailable. 
Phil Lacavara, the counsel of the special prosecutor, located Mr. Bork, who said we were now part of the criminal division in the Department of Justice. I reached an old friend of mine, Henry Peterson, who still is a friend of mine, who was then head of the criminal division. I said we had Mr. Haldeman coming to the grand jury Tuesday, and we intended to do that unless I was instructed otherwise. He said, go ahead. I said we wanted to consolidate files, but the FBI had met us at the door and wouldn't let us move anything, wouldn't let us bring anything in or take anything out. Mr. Peterson said he couldn't do anything about that. We asked who was in charge, and he said, Mr. Bork. For six or seven days after that, the whole staff met about four times a day. We were totally tenuous in operation. We had no idea what was going to happen. We did not know if the president was going to produce the tapes in court on Tuesday, October 23rd. We did not know if we had authority to pursue more tapes, which after all was at the heart of our investigations because taped conversations are the best evidence of all. They prevent a confrontation of one witness against another because the tapes tell exactly what happened. It was only after a week and a half where we thought that we were going to be back in business. On Tuesday, there were 10 impeachment bills introduced. There were 15 bills introduced to create special prosecutors by law. The White House was then totally on the defensive. We were afraid during that week that we were being used to perpetuate the Office of Special Prosecutor just to forestall the impeachment bills and the special prosecutor bills in the Congress. We knew that Mr. Bork opposed special co uh, prosecutors as a concept, and I think he opposed them constitutionally. And he did that in good faith. He just didn't believe in them. We knew as well that although we had the nine tapes as a result of the president's action on Tuesday the 23rd, President Nixon had issued an order that we should not subpoena further tapes. We were told by Mr. Bork and Mr. Peterson we could ask for tapes, and indeed we renewed old requests that had been pending when Archie was fired. But we did not know when it came time to go to court what the Justice Department believed, i.e. Acting Attorney General Bork, about executive privilege and about whether the court should order the production of the tapes. I think because of a result of the firestorm, the impeachment bills, the special prosecutor bills, the public reaction, which to us was the most heartening, and the congressional support, which was overwhelming and for which we were all grateful, I think Nixon had to back down. And he brought in Leon Jaworski, and the uh, uh, rest is known. Thank you, Senator.